Hi everyone, my name is Tony Rowe and I'm a professor of psychology and biology and the director of the program in cognitive neuroscience at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. My lab is on the seventh floor of the Graduate Center, which is located on the opposite corner from the Empire State Building in the heart of New York City in Midtown Manhattan. My research is focused on understanding the neural mechanisms underlying conscious and unconscious perception. More specifically, I'm interested in understanding how sensory information, primarily visual and somatosensory information, is processed in the brain to levels of conscious representations. I'm also interested in understanding how much of this information may be processed unconsciously and in what brain areas. To address these questions, my lab uses a large range of different approaches to studying consciousness. For example, we study patients who sometimes after right hemisphere lesions have a striking disorder of perception and consciousness referred to as hemispatial neglect. These patients will often fail to eat food off of their left half of their plates, fail to shave or put makeup on their left half of their faces, and when asked to bisect lines by putting a mark in what they perceive as being the middle of the line, will bisect those lines too far to the right and or will draw only right halves of images when asked to reproduce them. These patients are essentially unconscious of information on the left side. This neglect can occur not only in the visual modality, but also in other sensory modalities, including the somatosensory one. This is a patient who shows somatosensory extinction, in which the patient fails to detect information on the left side, but only when it's simultaneously presented with information on the right, illustrating that this isn't a simple sensory deficit of uh, sensory information processing. So just say left, right, both, or none. Okay, ready? Right. Good. Ready? Left. Very good. Ready? Right. Okay, good. Ready? Right. Good. Ready? Left. Good. Ready? Right. Good. Okay, ready? Feel anything that time? No? Okay. Ready? Right. Okay, good. So now what I... From studying patients with hemispatial neglect, we've shown that in these patients, despite being unaware of information from their contralegional sides, can nonetheless process perceptually information from their affected hemifields, albeit unconsciously. More recently, we've been using a metacontrast masking paradigm whereby a target disc is presented at some interval prior to a subsequent metacontrast mask. When the timing between the target disc and the mask is optimal, suppression of perception of that disc occurs and only the mask is perceived as hopefully some of you are experiencing in these demos here. We've shown using this metacontrast masking paradigm in neglect patients that not only is there metacontrast masking more enhanced in their contralegional hemifield, that is, even long intervals between the target disc and the subsequent metacontrast mask can still lead to masking and suppression of that target disc, but there are also deficits in their ipsilegional field, which is often presumed to be normal in these patients. We also study patients with homonymous hemianopia, who after unilateral lesions to the primary visual cortex will be unable to detect any information from their contralegional sides. For example, if a patient has primary visual cortex damage in their left occipital cortex, they'll be unable to detect any visual information on the right-hand side. As illustrated here in this Humphreys perimetry plot of a patient with a left primary visual cortex lesion, the darkened regions are areas of visual space in which the patient was unable to detect a very brief flash of light. Strikingly, in a small proportion of patients with homonymous hemianopia after unilateral lesions to the primary visual cortex, it has been shown that there may be some residual unconscious visual information processing on the affected side. For example, in a patient with a left hemisphere of a primary visual cortex lesion, the patient may be unable to consciously detect any information on the right side, but when asked to discriminate or guess whether a visual stimulus on the right side was on the top half or on the lower half of the screen, 
the patient would be able to discriminate at significantly above chance levels that precise location. My lab has been examining blind sight in patients to try and understand the neural mechanisms and visual pathways that may be underlying this effect. Some of the studies that we have conducted have suggested that the retinotectal pathway from the retina to the superior colliculus that bypasses the primary visual cortex may be responsible for these blind sight effects. My lab has also been studying a single case patient who suffered a small stroke to the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus on the right half of her brain. As a result of this small lesion, the patient initially had hemianesthesia, a numbness and somatosensory processing deficit on the left half of her body, especially on the left half of her face and on her left arm and hand. Quite interestingly, about a year and a half post-stroke, this patient developed an auditory tactile synesthesia. That is, the patient started feeling sensations on the left half of her body, especially on the left half of her face and on her left arm and hand, sensations that were felt purely in response to sounds. In studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, we showed that in comparison to normal subjects, this patient with an acquired auditory tactile syn synesthesia had more robust activations in secondary somatosensory cortex in response to sounds. And using diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, we showed that this patient also had more fiber tracts between the secondary somatosensory cortex and the auditory cortex in comparison to age match control subjects. These enhanced connections between auditory cortex and adjacent secondary somatosensory cortex are likely to be the underlying neural mechanisms for this acquired auditory tactile synesthesia. They are also likely to be responsible for the enhanced fMRI activations that we measured in secondary somatosensory cortex in this patient in response to sounds alone. We believe that these enhanced connections are a result of large-scale cortical reorganization that occurred as a consequence of the thalamic lesion. In current ongoing studies, we're following up some of these findings in this patient as well as in neurologically intact individuals who have auditory tactile synesthesia. We're also examining in neurologically normal individuals multisensory interactions between sound and touch. In addition to studying patients with disorders of conscious perception after brain damage, my lab uses transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, to disrupt conscious perceptions in neurologically intact individuals. For example, when holding a stimulating coil over the visual cortex, you can disrupt normal visual processing and induce a very transient reversible scotoma or area of visual field loss as a result of disruption of primary visual cortex. That clicking is a powerful magnetic pulse being shot right into this man's visual cortex, disabling it and blinding him just for a fraction of a second. That blindness occurs on the order of about 1 20th of a second. Using TMS over the primary visual cortex, we've been able to reproduce blind sight in neurologically intact individuals. We've shown, for example, that when presenting distractors in the area affected by the TMS, such that the observers are unaware of these distractors, these distractors nonetheless slow down psychotic eye movements to targets that are presented in the periphery, suggesting a retinotectal involvement of uh, these blind sight effects. We've also shown that subjects are able to discriminate at above chance levels various attributes of these visual stimuli presented into their regions affected by the TMS. In a recent paper that's been revised and resubmitted, we've shown using TMS over the primary somatosensory cortex that we can also reproduce numsense, the ability of individuals to discriminate at above chance levels somatosensory information despite being unconscious of them. We showed in the study that despite subjects being unable to detect tactile stimuli that were presented onto the hand opposite from where the TMS was being delivered over primary somatosensory cortex or S1, 
they, these subjects were still able to discriminate the finger at which that tactile stimuli was provided. Using magnetic resonance imaging in a subset of these subjects, we showed that our functional localization procedure of positioning the TMS coil accurately allowed us to position that TMS coil over S1. Using EEG, we've shown that there are distinct neural signatures between conscious and unconscious perceptions. In particular, we showed that the phase of alpha activity, that is activity between 8 and 12 hertz in the EEG oscillatory frequency bands, is opposite from one another when people are conscious as compared to unconscious of uh, visual information. We've also shown that this is the case for somatosensory processing as well, and that these effects aren't just correlational in nature. Using TMS combined with EEG, we show that we can entrain the alpha oscillatory frequency band to specific phases that then determine whether one perceives a subsequent visual stimulus or not. These effects were specific to when the rhythmic TMS was over the parietal cortex as compared to sham stimulation or stimulation over the primary visual cortex. This is in line with studies by Greg Worth and others that have shown that the source of these alpha oscillations are in the parietal cortex. In current ongoing studies, we're also using fast signal optical imaging, which uses near-infrared light that we shine non-invasively through the scalp and skull of our participants. Using this technique, we're examining how cortical activity differs between states of conscious and unconscious perception. Finally, in collaboration with Mike Beauchamp and Dan Yosher, we're recording neural activity directly from the cortical surface in patients with implanted electrodes, including miniature ones that are placed directly over primary visual cortex. In these ECOG studies, we're examining differences in activity in primary visual cortex between conscious and unconscious perceptual states. Hopefully that gave you a good feel for the types of research that my laboratory does and the approaches that we take to understanding the neural basis of consciousness. If you have any questions or would like further information, feel free to contact me at tro at gc.cuny.edu.